So Angel Blue, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And before we talk all things Tosca, I want to congratulate you on this week's Grammy nomination for Fire Shut Up in My Bones. Thank you. Um, I saw the opera through the live in HD. I couldn't get to New York and found it incredibly powerful and incredibly moving. And I'm wondering what made that opera special for you? I think for me, it was the historical aspect of it. You know, it was the first time that the Metropolitan Opera had done um, an opera written by a Black composer. And I think it was just, you know, of course, coming back after COVID and having the opera be, be shut down for that whole year like that. I think all of those historical moments made it what it was uh, for me. I just felt very blessed to be a part of it because it was such a it was such a moving moment in time for me. And a moving one for the audience as well. Um, yeah. what, what challenges did composer Terence Blanchard give you that were that you feel are unique to the way he writes opera? Yes, so Terence, I think because he has such an extensive jazz background, of course, a classical background also, um, it was, I think the biggest challenge for me was that on the first day of rehearsal, he told all of us, you know, you guys are classical musicians, and so I know that you're going to do what is on the page. You're going to, as we say in, in opera, come scritto, as it's written, how it's written. Um, and he said, I want you to do what is on the page. But then he said, but I also want you to go back to your roots. And when he said that, I mean, I, I thought about my dad and how I grew up because I did grow up, of course, singing opera and listening to classical music. But I also grew up in church, grew up in church, you know, playing the bass guitar and listening to gospel, singing gospel, hearing my father sing gospel, hearing my father sing classical music as well. So the fact that he made basically a blueprint for all of us to follow and then within that blueprint he said okay now i want you to kind of come out of the confines of the blueprint and make it your own by adding you know being able to sing something like peculiar grace and more of an r b um gospel style was something that i never get to do in an opera so it was a challenge in that we you know we wanted to honor what terence had written but we also wanted to bring in um our roots and so it was it was definitely a challenge to to be able to put the two together to really give ourselves the freedom or I should speak for myself to give myself the freedom uh, to do that in an opera on on a stage like the Met also you know um, it was it was awesome. Well, and it probably for you know could give us an idea of what opera may be like as it moves you know later into this century. I mean, we'll, only time will tell. I will yeah. tell you that I spoke to Walter Russell the third. Um, uh, when he was out here doing, of all things, kinky boots. Um, <laughs> and he told me that he wanted to be an EGOT, and he predicted that his first nomination and, and potential win would be a Grammy nomination for Fire Shut Up In My Bones. Yes. So, so yes. far, he, he's on track. He is. He's, he's wonderfully talented. I'm very happy for Walter. Yeah, I am too. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about this, this little Tosca opera a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. If if opera base is correct, this production in Los Angeles is only the second time you've sung Tosca. Um, yes, in a, in, a, in, in a production, and that part of that was because you had two different productions canceled during the pandemic that you were supposed to do. Yes, I did. So, what does you know after the the disappointment? I'm assuming that come along with those cancellations. What does finally being able to revisit this role mean to you now? Well, first I want to say I wasn't disappointed. I wasn't because I, I actually, to be honest with you, I felt like, and I still feel that when something like what happened with COVID and all of those cancellations, I believe honestly what that afforded me was not just a break, but it also afforded me the time to sit back and think, okay, well, maybe maybe this is not the right time to be singing these pieces back to back like that. Both I had two Toscas, I think, in one season. So, you know, for me, I actually, I wasn't so disappointed with it because I'm happy with how it is now. I have this production and then I do it again uh, next summer. So I, I personally just, just wanted to clarify that a little bit for myself in that I just felt like it was the right thing to happen in that timing. I don't believe in coincidences. So I think that was perfect. Um, this production is very, very traditional. And I, I mean, the way I look at this production, it's so helpful to sing Tosca in such a way that um, that allows that allows for me to actually really invest in who the character is and really, I think, become 
Tosca, and, and, I, and please uh, correct me if I'm not answering the question correctly. Is that, was that what you asked? Well, you, well, just what is it? What does it mean to finally be able to to revisit this role again? And part of the reason I asked that, Angel, is I know that the first production you did would be would not be a traditional, no, defined by anybody as a traditional production. So I'm wondering if it almost feels like this is your first, you know, I don't want to say conventional, but but traditional Tosca anyway. This is definitely my first conventional Tosca. Then you're fine to say that. Um, it, it's I'm happy to do it. I, I think you know, for me, the music has always had the same meaning. The singing has always been has always been the same in terms of you know the challenges and and the not so challenges. It's all it's all the same music. But I mean, of course, being able to express it in this way is is something that I'm I'm very thankful for. Um, it's a special time, and it's and it's the right time. That's more important. What makes it the right time? Um, because just kind of like with COVID, if it wasn't supposed to happen, it wouldn't have. And it's the right time. And every, everything is right. I'm the right age for it. I feel right in my body about it. I'm back in Los Angeles where I couldn't possibly be more comfortable um, to be singing this role. And, and this is a role that comes with a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, a lot of stress. You know, there, you have to be uh, vocally prepared and ready. Um, also dramatically prepared and ready. And I, I just think that everything is in, as as um, my, my band Radiohead says, everything is in its right place. <laughs> That's what I think right now, you know? That's what I feel. You know, that may be the first time I've spoken to an opera singer who's referenced Radiohead. <laughs> I happen to love the band and I really love that song. Me too. <laughs> have, you, have you heard jazz pianist Brad Meldow's solo piano version of that song? I have not, no. You must. It's great. Awesome. He, he does a lot. Brad Meldau, M-E-H-L-D-A-U. Um, okay. He's amazing. He does a lot of their songs. He also does um, exit music for a film, which I have off of OK Computer, which I love. Wow. Yeah, he's, he's a big fan of Radiohead. So he does these great jazz. He does them as, as a trio and also as a soloist. And if you like Radiohead that much, you should check it out. Okay, I will definitely. Wow, thank you for sharing that with me. Of course. Um, I know you said that everything happens for a reason, but if the schedule had happened as it was meant to happen or as it was planned to happen, maybe is a better way of saying it, this would be your fourth Tosca instead of your second. And I'm wondering how whether your approach to this opera is any different today than it might have been had that schedule actually played out as as originally planned you know, um, do you have a different do you have a do you have a like in if i'm tackling something for the second time it i think of it differently than i'm tackling it for the fourth time and i'm just wondering since it is now your second production if the if you're looking at this experience or approaching this experience differently than you might have had it been your fourth oh for sure yes for sure i think if it was my fourth tosca production I think maybe I would have been, honestly, probably less excited. Truthfully, I'm just being honest. I probably would have been less excited, um, just because you know, as as the, and, and not 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 less excited because of the opera or what have you. But I mean, just as, for example, I've done eight productions I think now of La Traviata, and and it's not that I'm that I'm not excited by the opera, but at some point, you know, the artists, you, you grow out of something and you grow into something else. And and I, I see myself having the opportunity to really grow into, into Tosca. And I think if I had been already now by my fourth one, I don't know that I would even, um, I think I would be excited to be singing it, of course, because I'm excited to sing, you know, whatever I'm singing. But I think the journey just it is, um, because it's my second and it and it's my my second but my first as you said conventional traditional tosca the journey is really just starting and that's good because it, it need, it's it's the right time for it to start so i believe had i done it earlier um in 2020 2021 you know maybe i wouldn't um i don't know maybe i wouldn't be as as thankful as grateful you know i was supposed to sing il trovatore here um, at Los Angeles Opera and of course all of that was canceled and all of it was it's just everything was on its head because of the cancellations and COVID and everything 
but it wasn't just wasn't I don't know how to how to answer I'm sorry but it just wasn't supposed to be that way and this this way is the this way is the right way and for me this is the beginning that's that's the way I will answer that is that it's the beginning and I hope it's the beginning of, of a very wonderful run of Tosca's for years to come well, let me ask you about that 2019 production in Provence that you did, the Christophe Honoré production. Is was there was there any even admitting that it wasn't a traditional production by any stretch of the imagination, since there was a new character introduced, um, and and I believe you were wearing you were wearing a hoodie um, yes. Yes. that I saw. Not not how I normally look at Tosca, but to each his own. But I'm wondering what what you learned out of that first experience that is informing what you're doing as a singer, as an actor, approaching it in this one? Flexibility. Yeah, you know, we have to be flexible as opera singers. It's, it's important to be able to sing. Of course, that's what our job is, is, is to be able to sing. Um, but with, I think, you know, what I really loved about Christophe was that his his imagination was just all over the place. It was wild and it was everywhere. And And what I loved about it was that he wanted us to go on that wonderful journey with him and because of that I think it opened my number one I had to know the music really really well because what I was saying and what I was singing did not go along with the the dramaturgy it didn't go along with the staging you know so I had to make sure that I knew my music well and then on top of that I had to take my imagination to another level of Tosca being my Tosca being this student learning from the prima donna who was played by Catherine Malfitano. So I, I, I enjoyed it because it was, it, 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 it stretched my imagination and it, it made me realize that I'm an opera singer, but I feel like I'm so much more than that because of that production. And hopefully the flexibility and the, the open-mindedness that I had to learn doing that production, I hope I bring that into this production, even though it is traditional. Well, it's interesting because I went back and I looked at an interview that John Caird gave to the Los Angeles Times when this production was first performed at LA Opera, which of course was three years after it had, it had debuted at, at Houston. And John Caird said something that I thought was really interesting. He said that the opera could have benefited from a second female character. Um, and then went on to say, there are things that are not terribly well done, but you can't worry too much about the infelicities in the dramaturgy the music sorts out all the problems. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with with John Kerr? Do you think that that it's a rocky, you know, dramaturgical piece of work, but that Puccini's music compensates for that? I do actually. <laughs> I do, because, and, and I'm very fortunate because I have sung the opera with another soprano, and and not just any soprano with Catherine Lafitano. You know, what I mean, <laughs> that's a, she's she's a legendary Tosca. So. Um, I, I would agree with him in that. I mean, I, who, who knows, you know, do Sopranos really want to share the role of Tosca? No. But, you know, I think that it could definitely, there would be something if there were was another, I guess the word is protagonist maybe um, in, in the show. But I think, I mean, of course, I, I think that Puccini's, his heart, everything about this man, every ounce of his being comes out in the music. And um, we're, we're I, I don't want to say it like this, but I don't know how else to say it. And perhaps the drama doesn't fail. Maybe that's not the right word, but I'll say this. We're, we're in, in music, you know, music is constantly going. It doesn't ever really stop. You know, the conductor never really, unless it's the very, very end, it's kind of always breathing, always going. And so I'll say that when the drama sort of slows down, that's when the music kind of kicks in and goes, you know, the music keeps it going. So I, I would agree with him. Um, Michael Fabiano, um, yes. who you know very well, Yes. Um, did Tosca at the Met and mm -hmm. is is now here doing it. And I spoke to him during the during the run at the Met, and he I asked him why he thought this this opera was such catnip for audiences, and his theory is is that it is that because it takes place in real time, um, that most operas are spread out over you know many weeks, months, days, years, etc. What are your thoughts on how this work is structured and and whether Michael is onto something that it's the real the real-time nature of it that makes this opera so compelling for audiences. I think he's 100% right because you don't have to wait. <laughs> you know, you don't have to wait for, I, I just finished doing La Traviata in Houston. And it's true because, you know, you see Violetta at the beginning and she's not well, but she's not sick enough to die right away. 
and you know it, it is it, it is over over time that you see her just slowly um slowly go to her death and it's sort of like that i think with most operas but he's absolutely right about the real time and, it, and i i also think that it helps us as actors because we're responding to things right away you know it's not like oh three months ago when cavaradosi was taken away by scarpia you know it's like it's happening right then she sees him taken away um she hears him um being beat she is is responding to all of this and and you know right away she kills scarpia and then right after that she goes to cavaradosi i mean there's he's absolutely right about that because it, you're not the anticipation is one it's one thing after the next and then you get to the you know the double bar line and uh, and you have your story you know there, there's not really anything that needs to be filled in i think yeah he also went on to say which i thought was really interesting that maybe this opera plays better now than it might have because we now live in a society where everything is documented in real time because of social media because of 24-hour news channels etc that that we're actually living in the world that Puccini imagined mm -hmm. in writing this opera. Yes, what, that's you, true. That makes sense. We everything is documented, and um, very very few moments are saved and kept for ourselves and and those we love. You know, everything is presented to the world as though as though the world is our inner circle, and that's weird, in my opinion. You know, I've 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 been on both sides of it where it's like, yeah, I want everybody to know what I'm doing. And then I'm on the other side of it at the moment where I'm like, actually, maybe it's a good thing just to be quiet and silent and enjoy this on my own. But I do think that social media will, will help with, with how Tosca is portrayed because it is something that is, as, as, as he said, is happening in real time and, and um, is being shown to everyone. Of course, I, I can't let go the irony of the fact that as you say, it's nice to keep some things to yourself and there's a video crew over your shoulder doing it, working on a documentary. <laughs> Three years. <laughs> so in, 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 in 2019, you did an interview with, with um, Grandma Lano and you mentioned that Violetta and Tosca were your favorite characters, your favorite roles, and that Don Giovanni and Tosca were your favorite operas to watch. And I'm wondering, from an, from a spectator's point of view, from you know sitting in in being in your shoes, what makes this opera so special for you to watch? Uh, Tosca. Yes. I think I, I I don't know. That's a great question. I think I I just enjoy the the I, the only word that I can think of is I enjoy the drama. I enjoy the brass. I think you know I love the brass section of the orchestra. And when and my favorite opera, actually, I should have said that is is, is Turandot, and I just I love the brass section and and Puccini uses I feel my opinion him Strauss Wagner, they use the the brass section like none other, you know and Terence Blanchard too actually <laughs> I know that because I had to sing with them and it's very hard to <laughs> sing with the brass you know one part of the brass section that's hard, um, but I, I love I love his use the way he he writes for the orchestra in Tosca specifically Tosca. Um, and then, of course, the singers just being able to, if I may say it this way, accommodate what what he's written. I mean, you can actually listen to the whole opera of Tosca, just the orchestra, take out everything else, take out the voices, you know, all of it, the choir, and you could listen to it and it, and it would it would probably, I imagine it would play the same, you know. So that's why I say we're there to accommodate, we're there to almost in a way... Um, <laughs> back up the orchestra and maybe that's I, I've always felt that way about Tosca I don't I don't know how you know correct that is to say as a singer but that is my impression of the opera and do why you, I go back to it do you think there are other other operas that you could remove everything but the orchestra and it would still resonate as well I think so I, I, I can't at the moment I can't think of anything off the top of my head I mean I know that I mean Traviato I don't think would play well as uh, on its own. Um, I think that I, I do think, you know, maybe La Boheme, maybe, but Tosca definitely. Right, right. And then the advantage of being in a seat watching somebody else sing Tosca is you don't have to do, you don't have to do a, all, a, all the work. You, you don't have to worry about what are their six high C's. You know, yeah. you, don't have, you don't have to, You but 
as somebody who knows what another soprano is going through, if you're to watch somebody else do Tosca, are you go, are you like going, okay, this is where I want you to 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 make this all sail through brilliantly? I, whenever I watch any soprano do anything, I'm always thinking to myself, just go get them, go do it. I hope I, I want the best. I want the best for for all of, of not just sopranos for singers, because it's a hard job. It's not an easy job, and you're under this microscope, and everything has to be perfect, and the words have to be correct, and breathing has to be correct, and blah 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 blah. And then at the end of the day, you're supposed to be, you know, this normal person without the stress. So it, whenever I see Tosca, whenever I see any any opera, I want my colleagues to do well. I want to see them succeed. Right. Right. Well. I think for any soprano, the shadow of Maria Callas is is unavoidable, and mm -hmm. and in 2021, BBC's music magazine Classical Music named Callas's 1953 recording of Tosca as the finest recording ever. How, how long is her shadow, and at what point do you think you and other sopranos are going to not have to face the the Callas of it all? Um, I don't mind facing the callus of it all. I I don't know I I don't know how to how to answer that because I think that you know she she's someone who I've I've read quite a lot about Maria Callas and I I can only say that I greatly admire her dedication, diligence, and devotion to her her craft. And if it it if it happens that um. You know, if it happens that she is the quintessential Tosca for the rest of humanity, then so be it. I'm happy to say that I've that I've lived in her shadow. You know, I, I don't I don't mind that. I, I can't. Um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I can only say that I'm grateful to even be able to sing the same music that she sings. You know, I'll sing it, of course, with with my voice and with my heart and my experience. But um Tosca is one of the one of the greatest roles, one of the greatest opera roles ever, and I think, from my perspective, any woman who can put herself into Tosca's shoes and make it through the whole evening and and come off stage with their head held high, you've done a, a you've done a great thing regardless of, of who has the finest recording or who has a Grammy for it or who has whatever, you know, in that, in the moment that I'm singing um, Tosca and, and, and whoever else is singing Tosca, th that's our moment, you know, and we, we honor Maria Callas. We thank her. I don't, I honor her and I thank her for the, the road that she's paved for us sopranos. But I mean, if it's always, if it's her shadow, no problem. I'll stand in it. <laughs> well, and, and let's be honest, somebody's going to have to stand in angel blue shadow at some point too. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, I, I'm going to finish by asking you about something that Maria Callas is quoted as having said. Um, mm -hmm. She says, an opera begins long before the curtain goes up and ends long after it has come down. It starts in my imagination. It becomes my life and stays part of my life long after I've left the opera house. So mm -hmm. what I want to ask you is, Angel, do you feel similarly to Maria Callas? And judging by the way you were listening to, the, to the, what I said, I think you do but beyond that where does Tosca take you now and where would you like it to take you in the future I think I just I want to I don't know I, I I right now it's I mean I was a young artist here at Los Angeles Opera 15 16 years ago and going from being a young artist to singing um, such a role where I was a young artist, I'm, I'm where I wanna be. I don't know if I can honestly, you know, I can't say, oh, I, I have this great dream to sing Tosca here or there or wherever. I can't honestly say that. I just know that I'm, I'm grateful to sing it here. I agree with her in that the opera starts way before the curtain goes up because we have to be, you know, it's like a vocation. We have to be thinking about it all of the time. We have to constantly be, work or at least I speak for myself again um I'm constantly working on music I'm constantly studying and I'll, that will never change I will be studying until you know until God takes me out of here um but there I, I differ from from Miss Collis in that 
it, the opera does stop though, because it's not, it, it can't be my whole life. I have a family. I have, you know, I have, I have a, I have a husband, I have a stepson. I have um, people in my life that the curtain must go down so that I can be angel. You know, I'm not always angel blue singing. You know, I'm, I'm as soon as we're done with this zoom and as soon as I leave this opera house, <laughs> <laughs> I'm angel. I'm gonna go eat. I'm gonna do my thing. Call my husband, you know. And the curtain will definitely be down. It'll be down good too, you know. Um, and it doesn't come back up until I have to come back and do my job, if that makes sense. But as far as Tosca goes, I'm thankful for Tosca. It's brought me back home, and that's literally all I can think about is that I'm home. I'm singing in LA. I'm with my my family's coming, and you know, the fact that they can all just drive here is awesome. I haven't had that. I haven't had that in almost two decades. So, well, and, and there are a lot of new restaurants you probably want to check out if you're going to get some food. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, I, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's what I. That's you, what I think. You you did well. I appreciate you taking the time, um, particularly since I, this is what Thursday. The opening night is Saturday. So, did you have dress last night or is it tonight? I had it this morning. You had dress this morning. Yes. Well, you've yeah. had a you've had a busy day. 